Just to recap a little bit is we have been talking about in the first chapter and we've been talking about uh, those qualities needed to be able to attain samadhi, uh, to be able to merge ourselves one pointedly into God and to be able to dive deep into the Om vibration and what is necessary for us to be able to to do that, that Om being the pathway to a deeper uh, realization of God and ultimately toward liberation, taking us toward liberation. So I'm going to pick up on that theme again today a little bit, but I'm going to take it to the next logic. One of the logical steps could be the next stages to discuss what are some of the obstacles to allowing us. And this is where Patanjali, of course, following his lead is how he takes this discussion. So um, let's begin. Let's begin. I'm going to take the, I'm going to read the sutras that we're going to be discussing this morning. So just to recap, the previous one where we left off was uh, through meditation on the inner sound of Om, one gains the power to overcome all obstacles and to realize his oneness with the inner self. Now, he's told us how, what, you know, you might say pointed out the pathway, but then he comes here to number, chapter one, number 30. Disease, dullness, doubt, carelessness, laziness, sensuality, false perception, missing the point, instability, and backsliding. These are the obstacles. And then, of course, we're going to go on and speak a little bit more. He continues on the next one. Accompanying the obstacles are moodiness, despair, nervous agitation, and agitated breathing. And then he gives a little hint here of what we might do. The practice of one-pointed concentration is the best way to rise of both, both the obstacles and the physical mental disturbances that accompany them. Well, <laughs> there we have it. I think in a sense, uh, all of those things, moodiness, uh, missing the point, a disease, uh, a sensuality, all of the, you might say, all of the usual suspects that uh, we encounter along the spiritual path, we encounter, he mentions them here, but he, he, he's somewhat, there's a certain quality to what Patanjali is, is uh, referencing here. And if he lists all of these qualities, and I, I'm not going to go over them one by one, because you have the book, I certainly hope. And there's no need for me to go over them one by one because you can read them. Swamiji, in his commentary, addresses each one of these. And so if you're uh, sometime, if you're feeling one of these obstacles, I recommend very much go into the commentary and see what Swami says about them one by one. And so you can read the, uh, that there just as easily as I could if I were to uh, address each of those. So let's not take our time on the those particularly, that as I say, they're all the usual, but let's, in general, I'd like to pick out a few points to, you might say, in summary, uh, that encapsulate you, uh, how we might address this ourselves. He makes, in his commentary, Swami Kriyananda makes an important point. You know, he mentions the first one of dis physical disease. Well, that's a physical, you know, I would, we can understand that's an obstacle. But, you know, even physical disease doesn't necessarily need to be an obstacle. For some people, people, it may actually help them in some way, in a sort of roundabout way. But, uh, it, but generally speaking, yes, physical disease has a, an ability to be able to control the body to, and the pain, perhaps, that comes with that. Those can be uh, physically, but deeper than physical problems and physical obstacles all of those qualities that he mentions here as obstacles, they're more in the mental world. And specifically, they all relate to attitudes that being able to end of the attitudes, they all have a general quality of being tomasic. So if you look at them generally, that uh, laziness, uh, 
missing the point, dullness, all of these things, most of them are their manifestation of Tomasic attitudes that in some, the seed of which we can, if we look within ourselves, and I'm not <laughs> suggesting you necessarily dig in there to say, oh my God, this is what I have. But some of them for each one of us may manifest a little bit more than in other people. So if you, if, if you look at all of those obstacles, they do have their seeds that manifest from time to time in each one of us. And sometimes uh, they may actually be uh, a major obstacle for us. But generally speaking, they're Tomasic attitudes. And so we have to ask generally, rather than specifically going into each one of those, about the quality of that darkening quality, that low energy tamasic quality. Now, we haven't addressed the topic of the gunas in this series of classes, and so I'm, I'm making an assumption that you have an understanding of the three gunas uh, spoken of quite a bit in depth in the Bhagavad Gita, and it's a basic principle of Shankya Yoga, the, the gunas, tamas, raja, sattva, the darkening quality, the energy of tamas, the energizing quality of uh, rajas, and the uh, upward purifying, uplifting quality of sattva guna. So that's, but I have to reserve that for a topic of some other day and make an assumption that you understand the terminology here that we're speaking about. But tamas is that darkening quality, that lethargy, that quality of, of dullness that comes. Uh, and there's a quote in the Bhagavad Gita that summarizes these, it stands in the Gita, talks about just, just as it takes just a breath to bro, blow away dust, perhaps on a mirror, just a breath. Whereas it, if there's rust on the mirror or uh, something obscuring it like that, it takes, you have to rub it. You, it just takes a little bit of elbow grease, you might say, to rub that away to bring out the reflection. And he says, but it's like also, if a, like a, a woman is with child, mother is with child, there's nothing that can be done except to wait until that child appears as is born. And that stanza is referring to the three gunas. It takes just a little bit of effort to get rid of dust. In other words, the sattva quality to, to be able to bring out perfection. Just a little bit of obstacle obscuring a, blur, a breath and it goes away. For rajas, those, those tendencies and those qualities within us that are a little bit more embedded, they're rajasic, it takes, we have to work at it. We have to put, but with an application of some amount of energy, we can get rid of those obstacles as well. But like a child in the womb, that's like the tomasic quality here, the image is that there's nothing you can do to hurry it. You simply have to wait. And in time, that child is born. And in time, those tamasic qualities are worn away. And so it is when we look inside of ourselves and we see that the obstacles to our being able to accomplish what Patanjali is holding out for us as our potential, and we see that we have some of these tamasic qualities, what do we do about them? They're not so easily, it's not a matter of just rubbing them away or just blowing on them. They're not going to go away. So. You might say, so it's more interesting, I think, here to say, what do we do if, if we were to just pick a few suggestions here? What can we do about when we see within ourselves, we have some of these uh, tamasic qualities, sloth, for example, lack of energy, dullness, laziness. And these are the ones, and they have they underlie much of those qualities that Patanjali is talking about here. I think that the best quality, and this is what's recommended by the Great Ones Master, you know, Swami Krinanda has written about this. The best cure also from my own perspective for tamasic qualities is to use your environment. In other words, put yourself in the company of souls higher than you. Put yourself in the company of an environment that is uplifting to and allow the environment 
to work upon you because one of the qualities that's needed here and what to to uplift ourselves tomastic rajastic any of the qualities we need to have to be able to we need will and he's going to go on here a little bit potentially in the next stanza he's going to say well we have to concentrate App application of concentration well that's fine that's easy to say but when you're enveloped in these qualities of that are low energy qualities of tamas you don't want to exert your will you don't have the energy to exert, exert your will or that concomitant quality of willingness you, to be will you don't want to be that way and so you're stuck when you're in these tamasic elements those seeds grab a hold of you uh they're they're pulling you down and you have to resist that but you don't have the will you don't have the energy you don't even want to and so here again we're, we're stuck we, when you can't Thomas has a hold of you and the necessary tools to be able to get out of it are because you're infected in that way are not there and so when you find yourself and you notice those qualities within you and remember we all have the potential for it and it manifests you may be on a little higher level and or lower level in each individual depending upon your spiritual development but put yourself which what we can do is put yourself in the right environment you might say that's the medicine you don't it doesn't maybe you don't taste good but I do, I'm going to do it I'm just going to put myself there I'm going to go to that class I'm going to go and be in that person's presence I'm going to go and just be there and endure it if I have to and you'll find that when you put yourself in an environment because we are subject environment as Paramahansa Yogananda said is stronger than willpower you see when we can't use our will we don't have it use something stronger and that's the environment and the particularly of all of those environmental influences it's the company we keep of souls higher than ourselves you could, or you could say it's putting ourselves in the vibration that is going to have an a salutary effect upon us and so you find you put yourself in the company of people who are cheerful when you're not you begin to you know it begins to at least moderate your your cheerfulness uh, of course your your lack of cheerfulness unfortunately has an effect on other people's cheerfulness so you have to be you know you have to keep that in mind but you put yourself in, in an environment of a large number of people and it outweighs your own individual effort and you begin to be that way and so consequently you put if you're somewhat messy in your you know you're not an orderly type person you put yourself in an orderly environment and you begin to take on that sense of order you put yourself in an environment where there's solid routines and you begin to take on those routines and you might think oh all of a sudden I've got it I've got it I can now then leave that environment again uh, 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 be careful about that because we sometimes overestimate how much we have taken on that quality and now it's mine and and underestimate the amount of strength that we've developed is really the strength of the environment that we put ourselves in so but in time in time we take on that and we begin to find that we have gained that strength we've gained that magnetism just like when you take a bar of unmagnetized iron or steel and you put it in the company of a magnet put it right next to a magnet over time that unmagnetized bar of steel begins to take on the magnetism so this can happen rapidly if we're willing and if we're actually trying to also attract that magnetism and not resisting but even if we're perhaps unwilling we find it in the company of the strong magnet magnet will begin to take that on so I think if you could sum this up for Tomasic attitudes in general and I think this is probably the best cure-all is to put yourself in a good environment where you can change and then of course you have to want to change also there's so that accompanies it but that too 
is something. Inspiration can come in the accompaniment of a proper environment, but it, you have to also be somewhat awake. And I think most of us are because we're, we're here discussing these topics. So we want to we want to grow, we want to wake up. And if you have that quality of a desire to wake up to and to be aware, and you accompany that by putting yourself in those environments that you want to, or next to those qualities that you want to take into yourself, you'll find that you'll change very quickly, and you'll be able to overcome those tamasic elements. And moderate those tendencies that Patanjali here is saying are the obstacles. And so suddenly you find in the right environment, you just begin to, oh, all of a sudden you begin to have these inner experiences when you're meditating, for example. Oh, I never had that before. And, and you begin to realize, oh, I, this happened, that happened. Be careful. You think, oh, it's all by your own doing. Well, it's not. But yet, it is a little bit because at least you put yourself in that environment. And then over time, it's like the baby is born over time. And in time, you can stand the magnet, the unmagnetized bar of steel can stand alone and be able to sustain itself. But it never, in my advice, we never reach that point where we don't need it to some degree. And so mentally, maybe physically, we're not in that environment, but mentally, we have to keep that environment in the heart. We have to keep that environment that leads us in. That's, of course, a discussion of attunement, keeping ourselves close to the guru, putting, keeping ourselves always in that inner spiritual environment and being very protective of it. The devotee, the disciple, chooses their circumstances wisely and hangs on to them. And you find, and then if, this should give us a little bit of humility to be able to realize to what degree, whatever we feel, whatever advancement or whatever progress that we feeling, remember from where it comes. This is why um, Paramahansa Yogananda very sweetly, he said to Rajasi Janakananda after Rajasi had had this very deep spiritual experience, he says, don't forget, Master said to him, from where your power comes. He said it very seriously, but yet lovingly. And Rajasi just very childly said, oh, no, Master, I won't, I won't. I know it comes from you. It comes from you. So this is something to keep keep it in mind. Now, uh, I think, you know, and I, I was fortunate to be able, even in the when, you know, when we're new on the spiritual path, I think one of the uh fortunate qualities i have i i always used to tell people you know how they ask you how'd you do in school and i says well i did okay in school but you know i was your basic b student you know i was never the a student and uh i think in a sense i was always fortunate to realize that i was never at the top top of the class i was always a little next one down and and I realized if I'd have been up at the top of the class, I would have thought, oh, look at me. And I was sort of, so I was always humble enough to say, you know, I'm not, I'm not that brilliant. And, and I knew there was a lot more potential. And so in a sense, to have that sense of proportion of where one stands is going to end, uh, keep, one's, uh, keep, one, keep one's sense of balance because I knew I needed something. I needed, I wasn't going to be able to do this on my own. And pushing yourself and finding then having the desire to find an environment that is going to uh, uplift me. I think that's that's something all of us need. And particularly when we're trying to overcome these obstacles. Now, something about those obstacles, we can we can recognize the seeds of them in us. And sometimes you may get discouraged. You say, well, gosh, I see that one, that one, that one. I see all of them potentially. And you might get discouraged. How am I ever going to get rid of these? That's what what the guru and what the spiritual path is asking us is to just try. Take you know, if some of them are blocking you and, and doing something, and you find that as you address those things that may be a little bit more strongly obstructing you than some of the others, others as you at least try, you do something, 
you find that in the perfection or in the cleaning up of those particular obstacles that have some meaning for you, the others take care of themselves too, because they're all interrelated on some degree. It's the same ignorance that is manifesting in all of these different ways. But underneath, you, the root system of all of them are ignorance. And if we approach it from whatever the one that happens to be growing within us and uproot that, you find that the others also are affected. So don't don't get discouraged. Now, one other point that uh, of the obstacles that I I wanted to address also, because it, it, it affects many aspects of what we're doing is, and it's something sometimes it's overlooked. And it's one he, that Swami references here of missing the point. And I, this is very important for us, especially if when we take up the spiritual path and we've been on the spiritual path for some times, <laughs> we've been on it for incarnations, but in this one, consciously, we become very inspired and it's so easy because delusion has its power. And sometimes, again, this is why environment is so, so important for us, because we put ourselves, we're enmeshed in this world and we find ourselves in many different environments. And it's very easy to get lost along the way and forget what is our true goal. Why did we, what are we really trying to achieve? And to keep that in mind, because it's so very easy to lose sight in this world as we live a life that can be many, many decades on the spiritual path, that we get involved in so many other things along the way. Remember, this is a lifetime effort. It takes multiple lifetimes to be able to perhaps even overcome one of these obstacles. So, Focus on one, two, or three things, and don't let yourself get sidetracked. That's so easy to do on the spiritual path. I, I, uh, you know, it could be many different things. A person wants to be very serviceful, so they say, "Okay, I'm going to start a business and hire other people, and I'm going to be very serviceful." And and they go a little bit, and pretty soon they start a business and. They forget all about why they started that business. It was just a means to serve. And, you know, you have to provide a livelihood for yourself and do something worthwhile. And the next thing you know, it's successful. Well, that's good. But then you forget why you started this thing in the first place. And the next thing you know, you're off, you know, you're you you're dedicating your life to building a nice business and all the complications that go with it. And you forget about what your spiritual goal is. Now, this does not mean to not be successful in your business. I am saying be successful in your business, but keep your goal in mind. A person starts out as a youth and they're very idealistic and they pursue their ideals, but this life is complicated. All the compromises we have to make and the next thing you know, they're uh, they're, you know, they're in their in their quest to be efficient in their idealism. They lose sight, and there's that story all for a rag, you know. Oh, the the sadhu, he says, you know, he's he's. Um, I know one of this, but you know the story. I think the, he's he he just wants to improve himself a little bit, and the, the farmer gives him says, oh, I'll give you a. Uh, you know, why don't you settle in the neighborhood here and, and I'll give you a, you know, a cow to pro provide milk. And you know, the fellow thinks it's a good idea. So he takes the cow and then he needs to have, well, how am I going to take care of the cow? Well, he needs to get, uh, you know, so he needs this, he needs that, he needs that. And then pretty soon the farm says, well, you, you need a son, you know, to manage the farm that you now have and I'll give you my daughter as a wife and on and on and on it goes and all for a rag. He was just uh, trying to live a little bit more efficient life in his little couture and he ends up getting engulfed in all the complexities of life. And you see young people start out that way on the spiritual path even, all for a rag and they lose sight of what they're really after. Now, it's not to say that engagement in daily life, we have our duties, but 
don't miss the point. I had a friend this un uh, recently, I have a friend recently, this whole vaccination issue came up with COVID, you know, and, and I don't have a, a point one way or the other about vaccination. It's just a function. I get vaccinated so that I can not worry about getting sick as I travel. It's not an issue with me, but uh, this person was very much against it, you know, health reasons, all sorts of reasons. And I thought, okay, well, you know, I could see that if I didn't have to travel or anything, maybe I wouldn't bother because I'm, you know, I feel I'm fairly healthy. I don't necessarily need that, but it's not a big issue one way or the other to me. But for this person, they got so wrapped up in it, it became politics, it became this, and they completely forgot this person devotee. They, they, they became angry when people opposed them. And, and I thought, all for a rag, you know, just some, uh, they got, they missed the point of why do we do anything on the spiritual path? Why do we live in this world? It's to find God and we have to do things in this world to make that happen. But keep in mind. And the interesting thing is, is, you know, when I was a boy, you know, I was eight, nine years old, you know, my goal in life, of course, I wanted to be a great sports hero. <laughs> You know, boys are like that. And I want to be a great sports hero. And I really wanted that. But then I realized, well, you know, you got a little older. That was not probably going to happen. But, you know, I still probably in some future lifetime, maybe I'll be, you know, I, I can't say that my boy, if I was reincarnating, and I'd probably still have that desire in my life. You know, I don't think it's so much trying to get rid of the, that desire of being a sports hero. The important thing is to find God. And if you find God, I think God will fulfill every desire in my heart, whatever it might be in some future lifetime to be a sports hero or not. And I think this is the thing is we, we live this one little lifetime and the necessity of this one little lifetime right now, we live this one lifetime. We've lived many lifetimes, but we can only live one at a time. And here we are, a very short time. Don't miss the point. And if you've been given the gift to have a desire for God, that's you know, the seed that's been implanted within you and you've cultivated to awaken it, to miss the point and to waste the lifetime when you have that desire, uh, it's a shame. Swamp Master would often say to a disciple, oh, I lo lost sight of you for a few lifetimes, but I'll never lose sight of you again. And so that, of course, is the Guru's blessing, but we have to attract that blessing. So keeping that, you might say, that focus, and uh, we keep that focus, and we find that everything then is will be given to us. And I, I think of also, you know, Swamiji, he used to say this as well. He started, he wanted to do a good thing. He wanted to fulfill Master, his guru's work. And so he started a, a spiritual community because Paramahansa Yogananda was very interested in spiritual communities. So Swami started the community and started an ashram and built uh, this work of Ananda. But he said that building of a community was not really the point. If it had succeeded, and it has so far, he said, that's wonderful, that's great. It's an opportunity to serve many people. He says, but if it had not, and I had been sincere in my effort to make it happen, that had been a desire within me, but I never lost sight, and we must not lose sight in the desire to create a successful community of why we started the community in the first place. It was to create a vehicle for ourselves and for other people to find God, and that must not be compromised. And I think it's so for each one of us too. Why are we doing what we do? And don't compromise it. You have to, and this world is always full of compromises. We have to make practical compromises to live successfully. But that ideal, we have to have certain ideals that this is what I'm going to do in life. And one of Swami Kriyananda's ideals was, he said, in the midst of everything, he said he would never compromise his inner peace. 
He says, if, if something was going to take him outside of that inner centeredness, that inner peace, he'd back up. He'd say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is this really what I want to do? And so this is just emblematic of one of those obstacles. And I very much recommend that you read the commentary and go through each one of these obstacles and see how do they apply to you? Do some of them have greater resonance than the others? And potentially then goes on to the next one of, of concentration. He says a very it's somewhat uh, uh, just a little bit deeper concentration is the answer to be able to address and overcome these obstacles. Well, I, when I read that, I said, well, that's kind of easy to say, but you know, and I was puzzling though, because that's a, that seems a little bit too simple. But I think there is also a deeper meaning to that, that, and I'm going to read that again. He says, the practice of one-pointed concentration is the best way to rise above the obstacles and the, um, and the physical and mental disturbances that accompany them. You know, it's a very simple statement, an obvious statement even. But I think what that means and what he's saying there is very much the same thing of what Lahiri Mahashai said. He says, solve all problems with Kriya Yoga. And how, do you, how do you fix your flat tire with Kriya Yoga? Somebody has once said to me, how, how's that going to help me fix my car? Well, he didn't, you know, that's a, a little bit of a cynical way to look at it. But what Lady Masha was saying there, we solve all our problems with Kriya Yoga by raising our awareness. When we have a problem in life, we see it through the eyes of our own individual awareness, our own individual consciousness. We raise that consciousness. We, re, we see it from a higher perspective. Instead of looking at the world on this plane here, we, we get above it and we see it from a higher perspective. And we see it oftentimes and almost always. We see it from a different perspective and we find in that view, we we perceive the solution to whatever that problem is. And so all of these, again, all these obstacles that Patanjali is saying, solve all problems, solve these obstacles by raising your awareness upward. And then I suggested here's perhaps the, the first key is to raise that awareness by putting yourselves in the company of people who have a higher perspective than you do, that are you know, in the midst of gloom, they, they're cheerful. That's a higher approach to life. Put yourself in the company and then you too are on that level and you see your problems from that perspective. And specifically, if we take it to Kriya Yoga, this is what is being recommended by Lady Masha. Solve all your problems by raising your consciousness, raising your awareness. You could even take it into a very um, physical point of uh, perspective here. Move the center of your awareness from the back of the brain to the forward part of the brain. Move your awareness from the from the center of ego at the medulla oblongata to the spiritual eye, which is the spiritual path that we're engaged in. The spiritual path can be encompassed in, encompassed in that very statement, moving the center of our awareness from the negative pole of the sixth chakra to the positive pole of the sixth chakra. That in summarizes of what Patanjali is trying to encourage us to do. And as we do that, all of these changes, all of these, these experiences that were being spoken of, calming the vrittis, having this experience of, of samadhi, being able to listen to the om sound, to be able to follow that om sound into that doorway of the inner world, which by the way is at the spiritual eye, happen when we learn to solve all problems by transferring our seat of awareness from the medulla to the point between the eyebrows. So solve all problems with Kriya Yoga or as Patanjali says here, the practice of one-pointed con concentration, which is much, you could say, a summary of the same thing. So 
if I was to summarize what we are saying today, we have blockages. There's things blocking us, but solve them with the practice of inner focus with Kriya Yoga. And you can do that just by, or solve them by putting yourself in an environment that'll take you to be able to do that and summon up that will and willingness that will naturally come. And I think outwardly we can do that, but I think also we always, we know that we can do this inwardly by keeping company with the saints inwardly within ourselves, no matter what obstacles you face, none of them are too great that cannot be overcome by Guru's grace. And this is, you could say the simplistic answer is Divine Mother, who and it was, I think of Divine Mother as manifesting or as represented by the Guru, be with me in everything I do. Try to keep the company of the Guru, keep the company of the saints within your, in your daily life and attune yourself to that vibration that comes with that. And then we do our best and be willing and have the energy, summon up the energy to actually put yourself outwardly, that inner, that inner company that you want within, represented by the Guru. Try to find avenues and practical ways to be able to manifest that outwardly in your uh, outward expression. This came up to me yesterday. I was feeling it. I was feeling I was feeling, actually, I was feeling a little bit ill. I got a booster shot uh, uh, for the COVID and it, a little reaction. And I, I thought, oh, I just want to stay home and stay in bed. And I thought, no, yesterday was uh, Easter Sunday. So I, I'm going to get, I'm going to go to Sunday service and I'm going to, I'm going to just put myself in that environment. And I didn't want to go because I was feeling not so good. But I said, okay, let's go. And then went down there, Sadhana Devi and I, to the temple. And there within, you know, 150 other people, I just felt so uplifted. And I came out and I felt completely well, physically, not just spiritually. I felt physically well. And you find that you, you approach that problem, you solve all problems, you might say, by putting yourself, transferring your energy to a higher level. But take a little bit of will, a little bit of effort, and you find that God and Gurus do the rest. Much joy to you, and thank you very much for participating with us today. I'm going to look, see if we have a few questions on the chat box here. And uh, uh, I have to use my, where did I put, oh, here's my glasses. Okay, the first one is uh, about uh, going into a state of, of uh, uh, not uh, breathlessness. I'd rather not answer that because I want to answer questions that relate to the, today's topic. Uh, if the topic applies in the future, I'll come back to that. Uh, false perception. Ah, how how do we actually how do we know we are actually feeling the upliftment of superconsciousness and not some kind of stimulation? Okay, let's get. That's a, that's a good question here because it applies to these uh, obstacles, false perception. And a, just a little bit uh, longer or bigger uh, question on that, which I may not have time to fully address, but how do we know if the experiences that we have along the way are true or not? Or how do we know if we're not being deluded or, or, or and it's interesting that Master too had these questions. And he didn't, you know, he had, uh, he wondered, did my really, God had appeared to him or he had in a vision, he had a wonderful vision, apparition or appearance. And he wondered, is that really true? And he asked, if this was really true, let there be some physical uh, evidence of it objectively. And uh, he was promised that there would be a, a, a very beautiful a perfume smell, a floral smell afterwards that would be noticed. And sure enough, Master could smell that after it had gone. But then throughout the day, people kept coming to him. And in that room where he was, they said, oh, what a wonderful smell this is in here. Well, where did that come from? And But even Master was satisfied, you see, that uh, this was a true 
uh, experience. And I think in a sense, uh, we want to be objective in our approach, not just subjective. You hear people say many different things. Oh, I had this experience and that experience. And you wonder, was that really true? Did they really have that experience? And I think we too need to be somewhat cautious, but not to the point of doubting and skeptical where it begins to block that, but to then, then the biggest, I think the, the things we have to look for in our spiritual life is not just necessarily the experience itself, but the, the experience that we have in our spiritual practices, do they have an uplifting change in our life? In other words, somebody may say they oh, I've had this God experience and that God, experience, but you, but they still, there's something wrong with them. You know, they're not spiritually perfecting themselves. They don't manifest love in their eyes, but they don't manifest kindness. They don't manifest willpower, any of these qualities, but yet they seem to be having all these experiences. There's something suspect about that. Now, not to judge other people, because we don't want to go that way. Who knows really what's going on with another person, but we have to look at ourselves. Is my life changing for the better? Now, when we have a very deep experience, there's a certain sense of certainty that comes to it. But even there, I'm, I'm saying, really, that's we can be fooled also. But there's a certain sense of certainty and expansion of as saying you just know the real this is real. There's something deeper here. But even that there's a sense of joy. In other words, when you feel joy, joy is joy and you feel it or bliss is bliss. Calmness is calmness and deep peace. All of these experiences, when you feel them and you're in them, there's a reality there. But we need to take it to the next step. Have do they have a potential or a tangible change to us? Are they are our lives expressing better for ourselves, but particularly is it noticeable to other people's perception of who and what we are? In other words, kindness, for example, are you manifesting kindness? Is that kindness perceivable to the world around you? Are you being generosity or, or joyfulness or cheerfulness? Is it expressing and you can tell by your reaction generally? to the world around you. Now, not necessarily specifically could an individual because an individual may have their they're just perceiving on their own. They're, they're expressing their own reactions, not necessarily generally. But do you feel that? And is other people being positively affected around you in some way, even if perhaps you don't feel it? And this is often the case. You may actually be making great progress. And you say, oh, I don't feel anything. But other people say, wow, you've really changed. And for the better, me meaning that you're so much more this way, that way, serviceful. And you you may not feel it. So don't be discouraged. And on the other hand, you think you may be having great progress, but other people just don't see it. Nobody sees it and it's not manifesting in any way. But all of these, of course, these are subtle. Because you you have to use it as a as a um, you have to use your discrimination here, but inwardly also when those things and then now just going back the other person was speaking about your breath stopping is your breath stopping if your breath is stopping there's probably some that's an unusual situation, so yes there's probably something happening there or at least is your breath slowing down is it becoming more calm. Is your heart becoming calm? Are you? And, but it's more the feelings, more than the, on the subtler level, more than just the physical level, that you're making. There's a sense of joyfulness that is with you at all times. That's just below the surface, and you can. It starts to pop through the sur above the surface more and more frequently, and you feel that loving, tangible support, the detachment is coming, your desires are becoming moderated, your, your, uh, your uh, relationships seem to be calming, 
and there's a love that's coming in your heart no matter what circumstances are you're less reactive to what's happening and less subject to the vagaries of day-to-day -day life and uh, the responses that are you know the feedback that's coming is is something that doesn't upset you even when people are upset with you there's an inner calmness and assurance of God's presence and you feel you might say uh, Guru's eye or Guru smiling with you uh, below the surface but remember as you make spiritual progress your challenges outwardly it doesn't mean they're going to go away you're just assuming larger challenges maybe so don't measure it from those outward challenges it's more measurable from your ability to respond to those outward challenges but that's a very deep subject which could be um, it will be a theme probably as we go over the, in the weeks ahead i'll come back to again and again and i don't i'm sorry i didn't answer that one about the breath stopping but it's a, it's a little bit too uh, it doesn't address today's topic quite as well as the second one did. So I'll leave it at that. Come back next week and we'll continue our discussion. Much joy to all of you. And God bless.